Hello and welcome. My name is Stephen Bryan and I'm the Director of Policy at the Legatum Institute. It's my pleasure to welcome you to this webinar, marking the launch of our report, Central African Republic Towards a Roadmap to Peace and Prosperity. This publication was made possible through the generous support of a grant from the Templeton World Charity Foundation and the sponsorship of the Legatum Foundation. The Legatum Institute is a global think tank based in London with a mission to create pathways from poverty to prosperity founded on inclusive societies, open economies and empowered people. But without safety, security and stability for all, it's extremely challenging to create an environment in which people have the freedom, the resources, the networks and the opportunities to flourish. And the Central African Republic epitomizes this challenge, ranking 166 out of 167 countries in the Legatum Prosperity Index, its pathway to prosperity is a difficult one. For decades, political competition in the country has been carried out through violence and conflict and the raiding of other groups for resources. Hence, a viable political settlement has not emerged, thereby hindering prosperity. Now, the state in general does not control most of the national territory or fulfill many of its normal functions. It's become the second poorest country in the world, with one third of its people displaced and two thirds requiring humanitarian assistance and one of the most unequal in the world. It's largely ignored by the international media and global public opinion. Nonetheless, it receives major international support through development assistance and large UN mandated stability force in MINUSCA. It's also situated in one of the most fragile regions of the world and has become a base for the Russian Wagner Group. Now, international partners have supported the idea of a unitary state and the government of Bangui. And this approach has contributed to the concentration of resources in the capital, as opposed to developmental support throughout the country. And because peace processes have tended to be Bangui based, these assistance programs have not managed to address the drivers of conflict, particularly those focused on local access to resources. And there's little incentive for most of the political and economic elite to change the status quo. Consequently, the prospect for conflict and violence continues unabated. Now, our report seeks to identify an approach that would ultimately allow for the creation of a pathway to prosperity, to involve a change from the current status quo, facilitating a ceasefire and a peace building process that could lead to national transformation. Now, de-escalating the conflict could be initiated by the government, not only declaring a national ceasefire, but also recognizing that it's not possible for just one side to win a conflict. And incentivizing the movement to peace in local areas is critical to providing long-term stability. And in essence, in this scenario, the government would delegate its authority to different areas, thereby creating the space for local accountability to develop. The search of process would also require international development partners to act in unison with the main aim of creating incentives for peace building. Furthermore, they could support local development by deploying their large foreign assistance more to areas outside of Bangui. Now, in addition, our report outlines some of the principles, the policies, and the practices that a local ba locally based peace building process could include, including conciliation processes that respect local tradition and culture and the needs of individual and ethnic social groups. Now, local elections or local solutions in particular, local elections are also up and coming, but local solutions are complex and they don't contain all the answers. But central plans and an idealized unitary state model have not been effective so far. And if nothing changes, it's likely that even higher levels of violence will arise in what is already a particularly fragile neighborhood. The proposals that we've suggested involve creating the opportunity and the means for Central African people and their leaders to gain more agency over their lives, offering a platform from which they can use to develop their country. And we hope this report continues to greater understanding of the suffering and the plight of the people in Central African Republic, because it's paramount for policymakers around the world to think constructively about their contributions to real solutions that can actually tackle these problems. So without further ado, I'd like to turn to my colleague, Carlos Montes, the moderator panel to discuss these topics further. Carlos, over to you. Thank you for that introduction. And, uh, and I want to introduce the panels, the panelists, and, and also um, clarify that uh, Minister Koba had been with us uh, just before the meeting, but he has now dropped 
from the line. He's trying to rejoin. He's just joining through, through the through the through the through the um, through the phone. And so we might um, have him, uh, you know, either trying to, to speak to me uh, through WhatsApp and then uh, me translating that to you. But um, to introduce the, the, you know, our great panelists uh, today, um, uh, uh, hopefully, uh, Minister uh, Jean Baptiste Koba, who's Minister Counselor for Investments to the President of the Central African Republic, um, and he is also President of Mesan which is the Central African Republican Party, which is a historic party in the country. He has also been very active uh, looking for solutions, for peaceful solutions to the conflict in the Central African Republic. Um, we also have uh, Luisa Lombard, um, who's Associate Professor at Yale, and she's a, a leading expert at Yale and, uh, uh, on Central African Republic. And she has two, two seminal books uh, on Central African Republic. This is one of them to do a little bit of a uh, pitch. And, and I have the also, also the other one, but uh, I don't have it with me. Um, this is State of Rebellion. And the other one is The Hunting Game. That's a, a more recent uh, book. Um, we also have Enrica Pico, who has also been working in Central African Republic for many years. So we're very lucky to have uh, in, in this team, um, in this in this panel, people have worked for a long time uh, on the Central African Republic, and she's now the project director uh, for Central Africa of the International Crisis Group. Um, Enrica has extensive knowledge, obviously, on CAR, and also has contributed to the book Making Sense of the Central African Republic. And um, I think my colleagues uh, are going to try now uh, to uh, to contact uh, uh, the minister uh, Koba, and let's see um, what, you know if, if that works. If it doesn't work, and we you know we apologize for that. Uh, okay, so they, they suggest that you know we start maybe with uh, with uh, with Enrica, um, and so the the first question that um, uh, we have uh, for you will be. Um, the Central African Republic is a very special country, and, and for, for many reasons, it has been difficult for governments to control all the national territory. It's a large territory. And with recognizing the difficulty uh, for one group to defeat militarily other, you know, others, um, would, in your view, would that help to, um, for, for people in the government and, and beyond to consider a radical decentralization um, uh, of the country? that could help to de-escalate de de the conflict and recognizing the autonomy of different areas. Um, please, Enrica. Thank you. Thank you, Carlos. And uh, thanks to, Le to the Legato Institute to, uh, having me, for having me today. It's a pleasure to be here. And um, well, to answer to your question, it's, uh, it's obviously something that uh, uh, we have been considering throughout the years because uh, uh, there have been uh, many chances uh, for uh, the Central African government uh, to um, increase the level of uh, decentralization uh, and to in some way externalize uh, some of the state functions to uh, regional areas or to other groups uh, uh, occupying some of the, of the areas. Nowadays, we are in a kind of uh, uh, different and new situation in which uh, uh, the state army controls and have a relatively stable presence in most of the uh, main town of the country and some rural area as well. But uh, uh, beside that, uh, this uh, military control and this uh, state presence, finally, also in the remote regions in the north, in the east of the country, uh, we have also confronted to a situation in which uh, there is uh, uh, no additional state presence that has been redeployed together with the, with the army. Uh, and this is something that I think it's important to uh, consider before approaching uh, the, the issue of decentralization. There is now an opportunity for the Central African government uh, to uh, finally redeploy not only uh, the national security forces, which has been doing with the support of the uh, bilateral allies in the past year, but also uh, civil, uh, um, also social services, also civil servants that can contribute to um, make Central African feel the present, uh, the presence of the state and the proximity to the capital, even in very peripheral uh, regions. 
And this is a window of opportunity that has been uh, created by the offensive uh, launched by the Central African uh, Army together with the allies since uh, the electoral period. Uh, but it's also a window of opportunity that might not last forever in the sense that uh, uh, the redeployment uh, of uh, uh, teachers, uh, of uh, doctors, uh, of other civil servants that can uh, um, really uh, represent and uh, finally make uh, the state presence also present also outside of the, of the capital, uh, it's uh, it's something that uh, uh, we it's an opportunity that we have now, but we may not last uh, uh, forever. So even before going uh, uh, toward decentralization and toward uh, recognizing the, the autonomy of some uh, areas, uh, the first step that the Central African state, state should take is, uh, I think, is in this sense. Um, finally, uh, make uh, some of the state presence of the civil servants that are in Bangui. Uh, make them uh, redeploy them in the in the region uh, in the in the peris in the peripheries of the of the country, and this will be already a key uh, change for uh, Central Africans in the sense of uh, being finally able to uh, perceive the state presence in their area, being finally able uh, to talk to re to um, relation themselves to uh, to the state that they just. Uh, um, that they just uh, imagine in some way, they've been imagining in some way for, uh, for years. Uh, and starting from that, then we can uh, uh, think about uh, some uh, uh, more, uh, um, some more uh, intense, some more, uh, um, some more uh, uh, concrete project of, uh, of decentralization. Thank you so much, uh, Enrica. And uh, just to say that uh, through a not very uh, common way, but uh, Minister Kova had been listening to to your uh, to your answer Good. to what's up. So um, um, we will see if uh, if if he's able to also you know um, share his his views uh, through um, WhatsApp soon. You know, funny connection. Um, Luisa, if you could um, um, if you could uh, complement uh, en Enrica's uh, answer. Happy to, Carlos, and thanks so much for having me. Um, it's a pleasure to be part of this. I wholeheartedly agree with what Enrica has said, um, that there, this is a, an, an opportunity uh, to try to make real some of the social services that Central Africans have been lacking for a very long time. And that for many of them, many of the ones who have joined armed groups, they have argued that part of the reason why they have done that is in part because they have been so neglected and haven't had any kind of social services. And here we're thinking about schools and healthcare, but also things like an ability to get a birth certificate, the ability to get some national citizenship papers and the kinds of things that can be really important as you go through life and just to be recognized as a citizen of the Central African Republic. I do think it's useful to go a little bit into depth about why this hasn't happened so far, um, or one, one reason why this hasn't happened so far. And that's that when we talk about kind of redeploying civil servants in the Central African Republic, you have to remember that people Central Africans, in order to get the kind of education that they need to be able to be in the government, um, they can tend to come to the capital, they come to Bangui. And in coming to Bangui, they come to a place that has um, some of the services that they aren't able to get anywhere else, including things like banking services, um, just physical security, um, some of these kinds of things. And part of the reason why it's been so difficult to build up or rebuild up some of these services outside of the capital is that there are a lot of biases that people have once they've made it to the capital about not wanting to go back to these regions that they too see as kind of benighted and difficult regions. Um, that is not going to change anytime soon. I mean, we can create more incentives and um, perhaps use more sticks in addition to carrots and trying to get um, people who are civil servants and drawing salaries from the central government to go out and actually take up their posts in the, the more rural areas. But it's going to continue to be a challenge. So I would just say that in addition to this, um, it would be useful to try to build up more localized kinds of capacities um, in certain in sort of rural areas of Central African Republic. 
And this will require a kind of infrastructural investment um, in things like financial infrastructure, telecommunications infrastructure, some of these kinds of things to make it a little bit easier to move money around and, um, and things like that. Also different kinds of um, accounting um, infrastructure and um, having greater transparency around the monies that finally are making their way into these locations and perhaps that are even being generated on a more localized basis um, so that people who are living in these places can start working to build up some of their own capacity um, to provide themselves with services, with support from donors, with support from the central government, but not seeing everything as coming from these, these, these kinds of, of givers of, of aid. And if we go back just a few decades in Central African history, I mean, you don't have to go back that far, actually, and you find that there were actually pretty um, advanced and effective means of generating revenue and providing services on a localized basis. I'm not trying to portray these things as perfect, but for instance, in Northwestern Central African Republic, as recently as the 1990s, there were cotton growing associations that were able to collect revenue locally and use those revenues for what people living in these villages saw as the pressing issues that they were facing. Um, so in addition to whatever kinds of support need to be coming from the central government, I think there are also more things that Central Africans living in rural areas can do for themselves and more ways that people who are um, coming in to try to help can support those capacities and, and bolster them. Thank you so much, uh, Luisa, for that answer. And um, I, we will we'll attempt <laughs> to, to have a, a reply from Minister Kova. Um, it, will, will, it will let me know if, you know, if, the, if the sound comes uh, okay, and otherwise I will, I will just you know, repeat what, you know, what, what he tells me. And to, to repeat the, the, the question for uh, Minister Kova, um, we we were considering that you know uh, the difficulty that governments have had in controlling the national territory, and and the possibility that recognizing that it's difficult to have a a, 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 a military win, let's say that is sustainable, and and and, and instead choosing a, a radical decentralization as a way to escalate the you know the the conflict. Uh, Minister Kova, let, 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 let's, um, let me have your your reply. Hello, I'm, I'm pleased to talk to you. Can can you hear me? <laughs> uh, yeah. So, 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 yeah. So so I, I think I think uh, from the reply that I get from Lisa, it's uh, it's they can hear you only a little bit. So I'm going to repeat what you you're saying. So you are saying it's um, that you are you are you are pleased to be in this meeting. Yes, you know, if you continue to talk and I will I will I will repeat what you're saying. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for having me, he's saying. Yeah. He 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 wants to First, give uh, you know his his thanks to all the panelists, and that he's really you know he, it's a pleasure for him to be in in in, in your company. Yeah. His comments are personal, are not binding in to anyone else. Yeah, he would not go as far as saying that you know there is a need to introduce federal uh, elements to the to the to the system. But there, but there is no doubt that decentralization is very necessary. And for the following reasons. We know, we know that no one party can now claim to have a decisive advantage 
No party can offer the city the traffic uh, uh, advantage uh, in a clear way. But uh, but uh, no groups can 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 no groups uh, can exercise uh, total legitimacy in the areas that they call. But some groups have managed to achieve legitimacy in the areas that they hold. And for these reasons, these groups might be uh, uh, interesting interlocutors for the peace negotiations that we have. Yes, yeah, that's that's it. Thank you so much, uh, Minister Kova. And I'm sorry for the difficulty that uh, we have on the sound. Okay, thank you um, so much. I'm sorry for the um, uh, the difficulty on this. So on the on the second uh, uh, question, um, in car history, uh, foreign actors have always played a central role. You know, this is one of the key topics that uh, Lisa explores so well in her books and you know history keeps repeating and so in our view in your view um, uh, a ceasefire and uh, move towards a more decentralized state um, would that possibly be supported also by international partners uh, for example by strengthening MINUSCA uh, military assistance and maybe with the decentralization of the allocation of international um, assistance um uh Enrica, if we can start with you. Thank you, <clears throat> Thank you Carlos. Um, yeah, uh, indeed, uh, the impact uh, of the international assistance uh, on decentralization uh, will be key uh, in the sense that uh, most of the uh, international uh, assistance programs and the foreign aid that uh, has been provided to the country in the past, uh, at least, uh, 20, 15, 20 years um, has been uh, mostly uh, focusing on the uh, capital or uh, the regional area around the capital, and mostly because they were the areas considered uh, uh, more stable in a security uh, perspective. So um, most of the time, in, in the recent history, most of the time, uh, the Central African Republic uh, has been trapped in this uh, development security uh, cycle in which uh, uh, the many areas of the country could not reach, uh, could not reach uh, a um, security uh, situation stable enough to receive development uh, assistance. And on the other side, that uh, uh, development that could develop those areas to uh, stabilize uh, has never uh, has never really uh, been uh, uh, disbursed has never really arrived in those areas. An example can be uh, the uh, plan for uh, reconstruction and stabilization of the country, the RCPCA, uh, issued in, uh, in 2016, uh, right after the uh, election of uh, President Badera, or the first mandate of uh, President Badera. This plan was uh, absolutely inclusive in the sense of decentralizing. Uh, the assistance uh, to the provinces and to the territories of the of the country, and uh, as uh, it was already the case in 2008, uh, with uh, a massive plan uh, launched by the European Union in terms of uh, uh, assistance to local um, to local uh, like to, to decentralize the region. Uh, in, also, in this case, the security situation, the evolving of the security situation did not allow a full implementation of, uh, of the plan. So in 2016, what happened is that uh, the, the, um, the strategy, the international strategy was made uh, according to uh, uh, the relative stability that uh, the country could enjoy for uh, at least six, nine months after the election. 
uh, but that uh, uh, but that was uh, completely uh, lost at the beginning of uh, 2000 and end of 2016 and beginning of 2017 with the renewal of several uh, conflict uh, um, of several conflict hotspots all around uh, uh, the country so this is something that the international assistance should uh, uh, and the international partners of the of the country should uh, carefully consider uh, they, they might find some window of opportunity, once again, to uh, decentralize their, uh, um, their assistance. But those windows of opportunity must be taken and must be seized relatively quickly because uh, they could uh, also they could, uh, be any time a, a revival of the conflict that could uh, impede this decentralized assistance to be, to be deployed. Uh, and this is something that uh, international assistance and, and international donors in general should uh, um, actually um, revise in their internal policies in terms of uh, uh, mechanism for spending, mechanism for uh, uh, reallocating existing resources. An example of uh, Bambari in 2017 uh, it's still quite uh, interesting because uh, at that time uh, the town was uh, freed by armed group by, uh, by MINUSCA forces and there was uh, a great opportunity to restore uh, the state and, uh, uh, and um, the, the local administration and in general the state function, the main state function in town. But uh, unfortunately the internal mechanism of several international actors did not uh, allow uh, the uh, readjusting, reallocating resources and readjusting plans fast enough to seize this opportunity. And six, six months later, the town was uh, uh, again under the control of, uh, of armed groups. So this is something that uh, also in terms of internal mechanism, internal planning, uh, and, uh, um, and uh, flexibility of funding, uh, the international donors assisting the Central African government should carefully uh, consider. MINUSCA is obviously key in, uh, in all those issues because uh, uh, is actually the only international actors besi besides some uh, uh, NGOs having a stable presence in, uh, in the entire country. And MINUSCA can uh, play uh, and uh, has played a very important role in terms of connecting uh, regional areas with, uh, with the capital. Uh, MINUSCA has uh, not only an armed uh, uh, force uh, in, uh, on ground, but uh, has also uh, offices all around the country that are all connected, connected through a satellite system. So it's the only uh, actor in CR that can uh, uh, make uh, 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 the prefe of uh, Birao talk with the prefe of Berberati. And this is extremely important in terms of uh, decentralization, uh, connection, communication, uh, relation with the central government, uh, and uh, uh, clarity on what are the resources and what can do and what uh, each uh, actor in decentralization can, uh, could do. So this is also a role that uh, MINUSCA can exploit beyond the, uh, obviously, the forces on ground. Thank you very much, uh, Enrica. Um, if uh, uh, Luisa, could you um, complement that question, and particularly with a focus maybe of the, you know, if the, of the European Union and major donors, and you know, the role of humanitarian and developmental assistance. So what I might do first is to um, step back just a moment from the, the specific question and think about sort of the situation that the Central African Republic is in. And one of the things that I think is very challenging about um, providing international assistance to a country like the CAR is that when we think about the world from the perspective of, say, the peace builders, from the perspectives of people working in that industry, um, then the, 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 it's a process that goes through specific steps and it kind of goes in one direction. Um, that's the way that they imagine things working. So you start off and perhaps you have a peace process, you have a national dialogue, you have elections and you go through step by step by step, you have disarmament programs, step by step by step by step. And then at the end, you come out the other side and you are a transformed country, you're no longer a country at conflict, and now you are a post-conflict country, something like that. And what's been really challenging in CAR and in certain other countries is that those steps have been gone through, but without the accompanying transformation that people imagine is going to be taking place. And what this creates then is a real lack of um, it's a, it's, it creates a lot of uncertainty around 
what exactly we should be doing in a place like this, what is needed. And let me give some examples. So for instance, we had a peace agreement that was signed in the Central African Republic a few years ago. Um, peace agreement, yes, but there are violations of that peace agreement on a daily basis. And um, I haven't been following it so closely right now, but you know, as recently as, as last year, there were dozens of violations of this peace agreement on a daily basis um, by all parties, um, just about all parties um, to this, this conflict. Now, what do you do with that? Um, there's a peace agreement. So in theory, that should be the foundation for moving forward and moving into you know, the next phases of, of, of assistance. Um, but the peace agreement is not being respected. It's not being made real in the lives of people in the Central African Republic who are still facing way too many exactions. So I think that this is part of where, um, you know, where this, where this challenge is coming from, that we've kind of gotten stuck into this mode of peace building that is very important, but that is very confused at this point about exactly where we actually are at. Um, you have some people who are assessing the situation in the country and saying, look, um, we've done all of the steps. And so therefore we can be moving out the other side. We're, we're moving into a mode of development and the conflict is over. And then you have other people, including many Central Africans who have been dealing with exactions um, sometimes by uh, their own state forces and by the, the, um, the military partners working with the, the Central African state forces. So also by armed group members um, who say, look, we're still feeling the effects of this violence. We're still in the thick of things. Things. And, you know, a third or maybe a quarter, to, somewhere between a quarter and a third of the population is displaced and in need of humanitarian assistance. So I think it's important to put this out there first as a kind of foundation and then say, okay, well, what do we do now? And one of the things in terms of international assistance then is I think we need to have a lot more clarity about things like what are the consequences? Um, if we have this peace agreement, what are the consequences for breaking the peace agreement? If we had a national ceasefire, what are the consequences for breaking that national ceasefire? And effectively, a lot of the international assistance has been um, working in the name of restoring state capacity, working in the name of building state capacity and that kind of, of thing. And there are a lot of good reasons to be doing that, but it also gets very complicated very quickly when you see that there are um, exactions that are being perpetrated, when you see that there are, um, uh, when, when, when you see that this is a, a conflict that is still ongoing um, in many senses. And so, you know, what is the role of international actors in the midst of this? I think that really needs to be clarified. Um, are we in the point of, um, do, do we need to sort of push in the direction of um, something along the lines of a, a ceasefire, hope that that can be um, put into place, and then um, talk about, well, what comes next? Um, what kinds of accountability can be built up locally? And then what role do international supporters have in fostering that kind of culture of accountability? And, and what role do they have in, in sort of perhaps stepping back in certain instances um, and, and see where we, where we go from there? So, you know, I think it's, um, yeah, so I think that's, that's, that's part of what needs to be a little bit more um, explicitly on the agenda um, than perhaps has been been the case um, up to this point. Thank you so much, uh, Luisa. And I think even on WhatsApp, uh, we, the connection has not been very stable. So um, we will we'll pass this video to Minister Kova and then you know maybe um, continue the, the discussion. But I think for now, you will just uh, continue um, with uh, with with Luisa and, and Enrica, um, and so uh, a third question, which I think when when we started working on the Central African Republic, one of the you know one of the comments that we received was that it was really good that we we were focusing on a country that you know you know not 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 many other researchers and organizations were were focusing, even though. You know, it's one of the poorest countries in the world, and the you know, and the level of, of suffering of people is really, really high. Um, and so, um, I, I was wondering. I attended a, a, missing, a meeting on, on Myanmar, sort of uh, lately, and 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 you know, obviously, uh, we are in a new situation now with the Russian invasion of Ukraine, um, and 
and uh, and I wonder um, both, uh, you know, Enrica, you just came back from from the Central African Republic, and so we would we were going to ask um, as well, uh, Minister Kova, you know, what what were the results of the you know of last week's discussion on the Republican dialogue, um, 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 but uh, particularly here, what do you think the the effect on the geopolitics, you know, internally, you know, there was already a conflict between the, the presence of the Russian Wagner group, the, you know, the mercenaries that support um, uh, the government in, in the Central African Republic and France and the EU, you know, there have been sanctions against the Wagner group, but now with their, you know, the intervention um, in the intervention in Ukraine, this obviously, you know, uh, acquires uh, another dimension. Um, and so does it, you know, what, what does it, what do you think um, it implies or, you know, what are the, the risks and opportunities of this, of this new situation, um, Enrica? Thank you, Carlos. Uh, well, it's difficult to, to predict. We're still in a, in a very early stage uh, of, the, of the war, even if uh, it has been going on for one month now. But uh, I think that uh, the, the, the positioning taken by uh, most of the Western uh, partner of uh, CR uh, is not, it was pretty clear before uh, the war in Ukraine and uh, is uh, basically not going to change uh, that much in the, in the coming month. Um, the, the guarantees that the, most of the Western partners want is that their aid and especially the budgetary aid is not going to found directly uh, Wagner mercenaries uh, present in, uh, in the country. And this is a condition that uh, was uh, put on the table since uh, the end of last year uh, to continue the budgetary support to the Central African state, which is dependent uh, for uh, more than 50% to external budget support. Uh, and uh, those, that uh, is uh, completely um, dependent of this uh, uh, of the support of the Western uh, alliance uh, for uh, for its uh, own existence uh, to maintain uh, its institution, but uh, also to pay uh, the salaries of the civil servants uh, and of the national security forces. So this is something that uh, uh, I don't think is going to, to change anytime soon in terms of uh, condition to continue the, the support to the, um, to the Central African uh, government. On the other side, something that uh, I think we should uh, carefully monitor uh, with uh, the evolution, uh, uh, according to the evolution uh, of the war in Ukraine, is the possible, uh, the, 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 um, the possible, the eventual commodity shock in, uh, uh, in the Central African Republic. Uh, we don't have to forget that CR is a country uh, completely dependent from uh, imports, mainly from Cameroon, but also from uh, other countries uh, in the region. When I was there, there was already a shortage of uh, fuel in uh, most of the fuel station in the capital that was not necessarily linked to uh, the Ukrainian crisis. But they already uh, provoked a very um, uneasy situation uh, in, uh, in the capital, uh, Bangi, and the close fuel protests uh, in the capital. And to have an example of this, uh, we uh, just need to look back at 2014, when uh, most of the country was, uh, um, was shaken by uh, intercommunal violence and the uh, imports from Cameroon could not reach uh, Bangi. But also, uh, we can also look back to the last uh, uh, electoral crisis. In the first uh, two, three months of 2021, the main road to Cameroon, uh, so the main supply road to, uh, to the capital Bangui, was uh, closed and many trucks were stuck at the Cameroonian border and they could not reach the capital. And those trucks were, was br were bringing uh, all like the most basic commodities uh, for, uh, for the country from fuel to food, uh, to any kind of uh, basic item actually used by Central African in their daily life. So um, this is actually something that uh, can get worse uh, with, the, with the development of the, of the war. And also in a regional perspective, because uh, uh, CR will not be the only country of the region affected by this. And uh, there could be a competition uh, within the region to access to the most basic uh, resources from wheat to fuel, to other uh, resources uh, affected and commodities affected by the by the evolution of the of the conflict, 
uh, this is not necessarily going to cause uh, appeal or riots in Bangui or uh, in other uh, capitals, but uh, uh, can for sure uh, make even harder the uh, humanitarian situation and uh, the daily life of people uh, depending from, uh, from those community to, to survive. And also from uh, not only for the daily subsistence, but also for uh, local trade and uh, uh, you know, developing most, most business uh, in the country. So the impact in the sense of the crisis can, uh, it's something that we will need to, to watch in the coming months. Thank you, uh, Enrica. And, um, and on, the, on, on what did you, you know, what, you know, you just came back from, you know, as I mentioned, from the Central African, uh, from Bangui. Um, and um, could you update us a little bit on the situation? And, and you know, I mean, there, there, there were before, uh, conflicts between France and you know and uh, and, uh, and, and, and and Russia. Um, could you just update us a little bit on on, on both situations? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, uh, the uh, the tension are still there in the sense that uh, um, the well, I, I would not define it conflict, but. Uh, uh, the diplomatic tension that have started uh, two, three years ago now uh, have not really evolved in the sense that uh, uh, for President Fadera, the support of the bilateral allies, which uh, include the Russians, but also Rwandan allies and forces, uh, is essential for uh, his own survival, for the, for the stability of Bangui and for the stability of the main institution of the country. And this is something that has not changed uh, uh, in the past uh, years, in the past year. Uh, on the other side, as I mentioned, uh, Western aligned, including France, uh, they demand uh, guarantees that the, their support is not going uh, straight to, um, to Russian mercenaries uh, deployed in the field for both budgetary aid and uh, other programs deployed. Uh, in terms of uh, uh, narratives, I think that uh, uh, things are somehow more settled now. Uh, the uh, narrative, the discourse, the public discourse were much more polarized during uh, election last year. But uh, not, it does not uh, uh, mean that uh, uh, in terms of uh, diplomatic tension, things uh, have improved. Uh, something that uh, also uh, is not um, helping in this, uh, in this sense, uh, the evolution of the diplomatic relation is the fact that uh, there is no Russian ambassador in the country since July last year. Uh, the new ambassador was appointed in, uh, um, in January uh, this year, but uh, uh, is still uh, not uh, uh, arrived in the, uh, in the country. So this uh, also in terms of uh, a formal uh, diplomatic channel to, um, to overcome uh, the tension between uh, different, different allies of the country will not reduce uh, this tension only to France, uh, as not really, as not, uh, I mean, as make things more, uh, as make things more difficult in the past, uh, in the past few years, uh, in the past few months. Um, so this is, uh, this is more or less the situation, the dialogue, uh, uh, the national dialogue uh, that was organized uh, um, one year, uh, uh, more than one year after uh, uh, the after President Fodera promised uh, a national consultation for uh, uh, to ease tension after the election, the presidential legislative election last year was uh, uh, concluded yeah. yesterday and uh, did not include uh, most of the opposition uh, and the armed groups. So. Of course, the conclusion that uh, uh, I think most of the audience has uh, um, seen on, on Twitter or on, uh, on media uh, are basically uh, are basically um, a replay. Uh, they recall that most of the conclusion that uh, we had uh, in 2015 after the Bangui Forum, uh, the the biggest. Uh, and most inclusive uh, uh, dialogue that has been uh, uh, held so far in, uh, in the Central African Republic. But uh, it's difficult to see how those conclusions can be put in place, can be implemented, uh, as most of the actors that uh, could be key for their implementation were not present in the dialogue. In the dialogue. Thank you so much, uh, Enrica. And um, there were uh, attempts uh, of uh, Jean Baptiste again to to call, but uh, I don't think we are uh, we're being lucky. Um, so um, 
Luisa, a little bit of, uh, of the same sort of issue on how this change in geopolitics can affect the situation uh, in the Central African Republic from you know, your perspective. So first, I just want to pick up on some of what Enrica mentioned that I think is really important, um, particularly around possible coming um, price shocks and uh, challenges around commodities. I think this is really important because even in um, quote unquote normal times, uh, when we're not dealing with some kind of major disruption um, to the world economy or many ma major disruptions to the world economy, um, the cost of doing things in the Central African Republic is vastly higher um, than even in neighboring countries. So if you want to buy a sack of cement in the Central African Republic, it will cost you at least twice as much as that sack of cement would cost you in Cameroon because the sack has to be brought from Cameroon to the Central African Republic. And this is true of just about everything, even things like eggs. <laughs> eggs get imported from Cameroon into the Central African Republic. And just think about transporting eggs on these really terrible roads and you think if that is the best way of doing things, then that is, is evidence that, that things are not um, perhaps working the way that they should be. And I think this is also important to mention because we've been talking about decentralization and um, the need to decentralize um, particularly sort of revenue um, and, and sort of management of services to have that happen on a more localized basis. And one reason why so much aid just ends up being stuck in the capital and doesn't make it outside of the capital is that it is so expensive to do anything outside of, of the capital. And I, you know, I remember sitting with somebody who was working for the World Bank, this is a number of years ago at this point, and she was saying, I would love to do something in Vakaga Prefecture. This is the one that is in the far Northeast by, by um, Chad and Sudan. Again, would love to do something for people up there. But when I look at how much it would cost me per person to do something in that prefecture compared to the cost of doing it in Bangui, I could help hundreds of people in Bangui for the amount that it would cost me to do something in, in Vakaga. And that's part of why we haven't seen more of this happening so far. And that's also part of why I've been encouraging people to think about, encouraging Central Africans to think about how can people not in Bangui um, develop certain capacities? You know, how can, how can they develop capacities and how can we support them in those capacities to do more on a localized basis? Because these problems around sort of getting things into this very landlocked country are not going to disappear and might even become quite a bit worse in the, the near term future. Now, in terms of the question, the more kind of geopolitical question about um, outside actors in the Central African Republic, well, I find this to be an interesting one, and I don't know if I have um, conclusions necessarily to share, but um, I find it interesting that for many years at this point, the kind of prescription of a lot of donors was that what the Central African needed, Central African Republic needed was to um, have the Central African Armed Forces redeploy throughout the country. And there was a major security sector reform project that was trying to bring Central African forces out into um, you know, the rest of the country, build barracks, do all of these kinds of things. That was the plan. Um, well, that has happened. <laughs> um, in, in, it happened faster than, than expected, and it happened not because of the traditional um, international partners like the European Union and others, I mean, they played their part in this, but it happened in the way that it happened because of the bilateral support and particularly um, the involvement of, of Russia uh, in the country. And so there's this um, interesting way that uh, the, um, the donors' vision for the country um, has in some sense been achieved, but in being achieved, um, the problems with that vision that I think both Central Africans and others who, are, who care about the country and who are, are concerned by the country had been pointing out for a long time are becoming all the more um, visible and apparent that in fact, simply redeploying or deploying Central African armed forces throughout the territory doesn't really do that much to address the kinds of um, grievances and also authority structures and sometimes predatory authority structures that are operating um, throughout the country's territory. And so that suggests that we should be trying to push for some other kind of a political vision here. And this is where some of this discussion of ceasefires or um, you know, some 
um, some other way to try to build state capacity in a more localized way might potentially be a more fruitful way um, to move forward, particularly given that the retaking of some of these towns um, by Central African armed forces and their bilateral um, 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 you know, compatriots uh, happened in sometimes quite um, heavy handed ways. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much for that, uh, uh, Luisa. And I think, um, yes, this, this idea that um, there's decentralization, which is something that uh, I think all the panelists um, have to pick up, um, it's, it's, it's key. And I just wanted to point out um, to, uh, to all the uh, people attending the seminar that we have just uh, put together, um, uh, put in the chat, two links, one to the full report that is being presented today, and another that has an, uh, uh, a note, an article by, uh, by Luisa Lombard and myself on why Central, uh, the Central African Republic matters and, you know, and, 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 and this search for a, for a, for a solution to, to build peace in the, in the Central African Republic. Um, so I think um, we have a question that maybe we can just uh, deal quickly, although we have been addressed uh, it has been addressed already, and it says, um, as international partners, how can we practically support a decentralization pro process? Um, and how, you know, if we pursue a process of decentralization, how do we ensure that regional authorities are legitimate? Um, if you can both just very quickly, because we are we are closing, um, uh, you can address this very difficult sort of question, Enrica. Well, I'm uh, not sure I can address it in two minutes, but um, um, well, the, the two issues are uh, in terms of how we can support the decentralization process, uh, the money needs to leave the capital. And there are only a couple of ways in which this can happen. Uh, creating uh, branches uh, of EcoBank or other banks uh, around the country and or potentiate uh, the system of uh, money transfer uh, through cell phones and, uh, and other uh, uh, mobile networks. This is the only way in which uh, local authorities, once elected, can have access to the funding that uh, uh, are allocated to their regions and to their, uh, and to their resources. If the funding have to go through the capital Honestly, there is very little guarantees that uh, they can arrive to the uh, peripheral areas. And on the other side, uh, in terms of legitimacy of the regional authorities, well, we have a local election planned for uh, next year for 20. Well, they were planned or scheduled for September this year and have been postponed till uh, at least January 2023. Uh, lo local election can be an opportunity, but uh, uh, if we uh, compare to uh, the electoral system in place uh, during the uh, past uh, legislative, uh, presidential legislative election, there are uh, uh, quite a lot of things that need to be improved in terms of uh, transparency, in terms of uh, uh, impartiality of the system, starting from the uh, national uh, election authorities. Authority. So this is something that uh, can be done in the upcoming uh, six to nine months before the, the election. And this is something that could make the next, uh, uh, the regional authorities uh, um, elected uh, in the first, uh, in the next uh, electoral round, uh, more legitimate, not uh, only to, uh, to the capital, uh, but also towards the, the local citizens. Yeah, thanks. Um, so in terms of how we can pursue decentralization, I think one thing that might be useful um, in addition to, to everything else would be to look at some of the Central African Republic's recent history. And there are is a long history of um, sort of grandly planned decentralization schemes that have not actually accomplished all that much. Um, most of their efforts have remained focused in the capital. But there's also a history of um, 
uh, actually fairly well managed um, sort of decentralization of revenues. And one example that I'll mention here is that the, the European Union funded a major conservation program um, in Central African Republic, still funds um, to this day, has been doing this for about 30 years at this point. And in the late 90s and early 2000s, developed a scheme where safari hunting revenues would be um, used primarily by the communities that were affected by the, the safari hunting industry, um, which was particularly impinging on their right to, to hunt and, and use those lands. Now, this system had lots of problems. Um, it ended up failing or, you know, because the safari hunting industry ended up failing in the Central African Republic um, because of the existence of armed groups and, and other problems. So it's not that this is some kind of a model that we should look to and do everything exactly this way, but it does show that there is a history of having revenues that are coming from a region in Central African Republic that are being used in a, at least somewhat democratic way in the affected regions to try to do things for people in that area. And when in those few years when that program was running fairly well, um, elderly people were receiving pensions um, in some of these villages. And there was a, you know, a lot that was going on um, from this. So it's not impossible. You know, these, there, there are examples of this kind of um, approach um, being used in Central African Republic. And, and, um, and I think that that is something that we can, uh, you know, to a certain extent, build on, learn from, um, think about what worked in that system and also what didn't work um, and perhaps perhaps use that going forward. There was one more question um, in the chat that I noticed. I think there were several questions, but one that jumped out at me about accountability. And um, I've mentioned this word accountability several times. So what do I actually mean by that? And um, I'm glad that you called me out on that because uh, I don't exactly know what I mean by that. What I mean particularly is that this is a really important issue and I don't think that we have really thought through what accountability means um, in these kinds of, of contexts. Um, what is, um, you know, what, what are what are the lines um, for at what point um, there needs to be some kind of consequence um, for breaching a peace agreement for um, for anything along those, those lines. And so I wanted to primarily just seed that as an idea that I think this is something that you know, really Central Africans need to be thinking about, and all the rest of us um, who care about this country and care about people there, um, what kinds of, um, you know, when, when terms are not respected, um, what kinds of consequences should there be? And how do we make sure that this account accountability, this sort of sense of responsibility is, a, is, is felt in a mutual kind of away. And this is part of, too, why I've been talking about things like developing more localized revenue, um, you know, revenue streams, um, because historically, that is where a sense of, uh, you know, accountability comes from there being some kind of a relationship between sort of taxation and services. Um, and we haven't really had a lot of that in the Central African Republic because of the way that the state is working, because of this history of conflict and, and other things. Um, and I think that's uh, at least one part of the problem. Um, so how do you try to build that um, up into the future? I want to put that on the table so that, um, you know, all of you wonderful attendees of this meeting can be thinking about it and working on it. And hopefully we can arrive at a, you know, a more, a more prosperous and peaceful um, Central African Republic very soon. Thank you so much, Luisa, and, and particularly for that uh, hopeful note uh, of how in the past uh, revenues, you know, work at a local level, but also I think in the, in the, in the note that, uh, that we work together, you, you mentioned on how not in the distant past, you know, people look at Central African Republic as a country to go to, as a country to look for, you know, for for the well-being of your family. So, you know, we're all um, hoping that that um, will return. And um, but you know, uh, especially special thanks to to you, Luisa and Enrica, that have been very supportive through all this process. And you know, unfortunately, we don't have uh, Minister Kova, but he has been quite. Um, quite supportive as well and he was very keen as you could see with the whatsapp messages and you know to participate and you know but we will will you know pass all this information for him and we are running a little bit out of time um but uh thank you to everyone and, and to all the attendees and i will uh, pass it to my colleague steven um to close the event okay. steven. thank you carlos um and, and thank you luisa and, and Rika. um 
for all your contributions and, and also Minister Koba. I find it quite interesting to hear him be supportive of decentralization, but perhaps drawing a line at, at, at federalism, it'll be interesting to explore with him what he really means by that. And Erika, your um, additional, I think, economic and financial lens just at the end, in terms of price, uh, price shocks and the importance of getting a banking system up and running, a uh, very interesting additional angle to it. Uh, and Louisa, your, uh, your emphasis on transformation, particularly the establishment of local state capacity, uh, definitely seems to be very much part of the, the solution. So we, we really want to uh, stay engaged with this problem and this challenge. I welcome an opportunity to collaborate with, uh, with you all and all the participants on this, uh, this webinar as well, as we seek to identify those pathways to prosperity for the Central African Republic. As Carlos mentioned, the, uh, the links to the reports are in the chat and we'll be emailing them out to you uh, later. And do stay in touch. And if you wish to uh, contact us, uh, please do uh, email us at info at li.com. Uh, get access to the reports on our website. And thank you again for uh, joining the event and for all of us at the Institute. Uh, thank you and goodbye.